Blood Bank Guy Essentials 009. Not oh. Ariel. Gosh, don't use Not that. Ariel. Okay. It's the worst. <laughs> What's, what's wrong with Ariel? What's the it's deal? It's just horrible. I tell you, you, make a slide and, you know, do it all right. Make the uh-huh. heading and make like four bullets if you want or whatever and make your little text and put it all in Ariel Okay. and then copy the duplicate the slide and put it all in Calibri and you flip them both up and you'll want to puke when you look <laughs> at Ariel. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. This is episode 009, and my name is Joe Chaffin. I'm your host. Uh, This episode is a first for this podcast. Today, I'm going to be speaking with a non-blood banker about a topic that is not blood banking. Now, that doesn't make sense, does it? But wait, don't go. I promise this is going to be useful for you. My guest today is Dr. Christine Crafts from the University of Minnesota. Christine is a master teacher who has won numerous Teacher of the Year awards from the Minnesota Schools of Medicine and Dentistry, and she's going to share some of her teaching expertise with us today. You know, great medical presentations do not just happen. They take planning, preparation, and practice, and good stuff doesn't just happen automatically. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a pretty good chance that you'll be asked to make a medical presentation at some point, and you don't want it to stink. Instead, Dr. Crafts wants to help you make that next presentation awesome. So whether you've given one lecture, 4,000 lectures, please check out this episode and hear what she has to say. I promise that you're going to learn something. So here we go with Dr. Christine Crafts giving her top five tips to make your next presentation awesome. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Blood Bank Guy Essentials, episode 009. Uh, I am super excited to have as my guest today, Dr. Christine Crafts from the University of Minnesota. Christine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. It, it's it's so cool to have you here. I got to tell you, there there's uh, going to be a lot of blood bank people that are going to say, Christine Crafts, not a familiar name, but <laughs> I want to tell everyone exactly why you should be familiar to people. Um Dr. Crafts is an assistant professor in the Department of Basic Sciences at the University of Minnesota School of Medicine, as well as an assistant professor in the Department of Diagnostic and Biological Sciences in the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry. Uh, She is trained in both anatomic and clinical pathology and did hematopathology and molecular diagnostic pathology fellowships all at the University of Minnesota. So you're a Minnesota girl, right, Christine? I am. I never left. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Why you should know about Dr. Crafts, though, is, is my favorite part about this. There are two reasons. Number one, uh, in, back in 2009, um, Christine decided to do something that, that many people have done, but quite frankly, she does it better than just about anyone I've seen. She started a website, which is called pathologystudent.com. Uh, pathologystudent.com is a, is a site that teaches not only basic pathology, but also has a, a special emphasis on hematopathology, given uh, Christine's expertise. This, this site has just an enormous amount of information for students of, of basic pathology. It's, uh, it, it really is incredible. It's a great resource. She blogs consistently there. She has a newsletter called Pathbytes that goes out to, I don't even know how many people every day. Uh, if you look on Facebook, her, her Facebook page has over 21,000 followers, for crying out loud. Makes me feel <laughs> totally inadequate. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, so not only does she do that, but she's also got a number of ebooks that are available on the site. Uh, and I, I love that about, about Dr. Kraft's story. But, but one of the things that, in fact, my favorite thing about Dr. Kraft's story is that when you look at her bio, and I did this, I looked back at, uh, at all the honors and awards that she's gotten. Going back through since 2001, and including this year, 2016, she has won at least one Faculty of the Year or Teacher of the Year award uh, at the University of Minnesota for every freaking year except <laughs> for 20, 2003, 2007, and 2010. So, Christine, what were you doing in 3, 7, and 10? What's you know, the deal? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I must have been doing something different. No. <laughs> Clearly. I don't students are the students are really kind and you just it, it doesn't take a lot to to um to make them appreciative. You just mm-hmm. have to kind of show up and, and care and and that's that's all it really takes. So Well, I, I would say it takes a little bit more than that and <laughs> and 
uh, w- one of my favorite things that, that I've ever seen is in the picture this year for the, the, that you got the Distinguished Teacher uh, Post-Baccalaureate Graduate and Professional Teaching Award. And there's a picture of you where you're holding a rubber chicken. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> I don't really like the picture that much, but I love the chicken. I love that. <laughs> This, I mean, I did not think I would win this award at, at all. And I, I told the person who nominated me, this is, you know, are you sure? It's a lot of work. And uh, because the people that win it are really, you know, they're really accomplished and they're international and I'm not. Uh, so wow. holding the chicken was, was awesome. <laughs> well, I, I, w- I would argue that your, that your impact, uh, while, uh, you know, maybe not international in the traditional sense is international in, in terms of the impact you've had. I, I would love if you would just take a moment before we get into our topic, just take a, a, a real quick moment to, to let us know um, what is it that, that really gets you going about teaching? Why, why is this the pathway that you've chosen? Which is, I think you would admit, it's somewhat of a non-traditional pathway. It is. It is non-traditional. And um, it takes some thought, I think, to break out of the, the roles that are set ahead for you. You know, when you, when you go to medical school, you're kind of pushed to just go straight through. You're not really encouraged to take a year off and think, you know, Mm -hmm. um, you're certainly not encouraged to take time off between medical school and residency. And, um, I did, I did that. I I took time off and, um, it it was more for personal reasons. I got married and I wanted to um, be in the same class as my, my husband at the time, but Mm. it just gave me a chance to kind of pause and think. And, um, I just realized when I went to medical school, I, the med school was a more of a family practice oriented school. And I realized I didn't really like that that much. Mm, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I, th- I still think it's very important, but it wasn't really um, me. Right. And so I kind of fell into pathology, not expecting to. And then I went through my pathology residency and everyone was, you know, going out to private practice and making a lot of money. And um, mm. I, it would have been easy to just kind of do that. Um, but I realized I didn't really like that kind of work that much. What I liked was teaching Mm. and I'd been doing that all along. And so I just kind of kept, kept doing what I enjoyed. Um, it's just, it's just really energizing to interact with students and, and when you explain something and they get it and they say, well, that's all it is, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that's no harder than that. Um, it's just really fun. And, um, like I, like I said, they're really appreciative for, for very little effort. Um, you kind of get a lot of good feeling back. So Mm -hmm. it makes it sound very selfish. (laughs) I do do want to do good things for people. (laughs) Well, um, and you clearly have, I, I, I think what, what I've said to people when people ask me about why I like to teach and I, I, I know from knowing you well enough that, that this will ring true for you as well is just the, just the feeling that you get when someone is sitting across from you and you, and you come up with some creative, out of your mind, never thought of it this way before way to, to make something clear to them. And the light goes on in their eyes oh, yeah. as a, as a teacher, there's nothing better. Yeah, that's, tr- that's absolutely true. There's a lot of creativity that's, um, that you can use if you choose. And I like mm-hmm. that too. You don't have mm-hmm. to just stick to somebody else's rules. So that's fun. For sure. Well, and, and that, that actually brings us to what I, uh, the reason that I wanted you to, to be on the podcast. You, you are not going to take us through some obscure blood bank thing today. I know you're relieved about that. No, I was planning <laughs> on that. Can't we do oh, that? Oh, really? Darn. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm going to throw a big curve at you then, okay. <laughs> uh, because we are going to talk about something that you have, you have talked about extensively on your blog that, that I just love. So we're going to talk today about the top five tips to make your next presentation awesome. Uh, And this is something that you've covered on your blog uh, pretty extensively. Uh, You did several posts back in 2014 discussing this. Um, So before we get started, before we do tip number one, why don't you tell us a little bit about what caused you, what's the need that you saw that caused you to to address this? Well, I think from the very first lecture I gave, um, I realized that there was a lot of room for improvement in my mm. own lectures. And, and there were some slides that, that clicked with students and some that didn't. And I think having been a medical student, I was a little bit ahead of the curve um, mm-hmm. for, for people who hadn't been medical students. They hadn't sat through, you know, eight hours of lecture a day with with some PowerPoints that weren't so great. Mm-hmm. So I, I feel like having been through that, I, I started out a little bit um, 
I started out okay, but there was a lot of room for improvement. And mm-hmm. just listening to what the students liked and what they didn't like and what worked and when they seemed to zone out, <laughs> right? Um, I just wanted to, I wanted to be more effective. And so yeah. it's just kind of trial and error over, over the years. And um, a lot of it just makes total sense, but right. um, you have to do it for a long time to, to get to that point. So that's the thing, isn't it? it and, and it's so important because when when you're up there and you're presenting, whether you're doing it in front of a bunch of people, whether you're doing it one on one, whether you're doing it on a webinar, really the principles are are fairly similar. The, your job is to get the get the points across to people in the least distracting and most effective way possible. I mean, is that a fair way to put it? Is that what yeah, you think of? I think so. Yeah. Although um, I, I would add that if you're giving a lecture in a lecture hall and the, mm-hmm. the lights are low, especially for pathology, we tend to turn them low so you can see the pictures. And sometimes a little distraction is a good thing because mm-hmm. you can't really pay attention for more than a study says of like 10 minutes or so. You can right. pay attention for 10 minutes. And so, um, but it has to be a, a healthy distraction. It can't be something too bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> right. But in general, no, I think that's true. You want, you don't want your presentation itself to, uh, take the attention you want you want the attention to be on the content and right. extraneous stuff tends to just detract from that cool okay well let, let us uh with that let us get started because we've got five the top five tips to go through we need to we need to start with number one okay. christine why don't you tell us well, number one what is the first tip to make your next presentation awesome well i think the the first tip that I thought of was um, related to the template that that you can pick either in PowerPoint or Keynote, and I, I thought of that first because that's where most people start um, when they have a presentation due. They'll just open up PowerPoint and, and pick a template and start writing, and mm-hmm. that may or may not be the best way to do it, but that seems to be kind of typical. And so I wanted to address that idea of the template um, because so many people will pick a template and, and that's not always necessarily the best way to do it. Um, I, I find for medical presentations, it, it's often better to not have a template, to have your mm. own template, I guess. Um, if you pick something that has already been designed by PowerPoint, it's very likely going to have something, um, kind of fancy on it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to have a border that's got curly cues or it's going to have some, <laughs> some weird lines going through the back that you have no idea why they're there and they're on every slide. Um, you know, right. uh, a lot I was, was going to make, I was going to make a joke there about Microsoft, but, but sadly, uh, Apple keynote has the same deal. Uh, just they incredibly do. complicated, they complicated do. backgrounds. They're a little bit classier, but they're still too complicated <laughs> 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 and something can look pretty classy and interesting, but that might not be the best, you know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's not necessarily the best, interesting, most interesting looking thing. Mm -hmm. It's the simplest thing. So, so, so how would you, how would you go about that? I mean, when you open up a new presentation, um, you're, you're typically presented with this grand array, this palette of, of different themes that you can choose from, uh, just practically speaking, how do you avoid that? What do you do? I just don't use them. <laughs> um, that sounds really glib, <laughs> but um, I don't. I, I've, I've come to, to learn what works best in my lecture hall or um, in a different presentation setting when I'm presenting, you know, maybe to a small room of people and we're just sitting in front of the computer. That's different, too. So in mm-hmm. every setting, I think there's a, probably a good, um, some, some good rules to use. In the lecture mm-hmm. hall, the slides should be dark, I think, because the lights are low. Um, for my um, presentations, mm-hmm. we're, we're looking at a lot of histology slides, so the lights are down, and if you switch to a, a white background, um, that's like a shock to the eyes. It's like, right. whoa, it's really bright. So I have a just a plain black background now. I used to do colors, and I don't mm-hmm. even do that anymore. And um, just simple white text. It sounds really boring, and it, and it kind of mm-hmm. is, but... Um, <laughs> There's there's really nothing in there, and I've 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 um, played around with that, trying to you know put lines in to um, um, separate the the header from the rest of the slide and stuff, and I just find that it's better not to. Mm-hmm. Um, in other settings, you might want to pick a template. You know, um, if you're presenting to a room full of people, it's more like a boardroom, and uh, it's it's more of a professional businessy kind of setting. Then mm-hmm. maybe it's a little bit different. But for for medical presentations to students, I think you want to avoid using those templates. Now, having said that, I'm sure there are some that are, are reasonable that aren't that bad. Um, but mm-hmm. it, it is probably better to just start with your own. Um, sure. Just plain background, white or black, and start from there. Well, and in, in some cases, 
I, I, I'm obviously, you know, this in some cases, for example, when I'm giving a presentation to a hospital and I'm representing my blood center, my blood center has already picked out a background or a yeah. template that to you. So in some cases, there's not any choices. And I, I think we, we can talk about the rest of your tips will kind of help when you've when you're dealing with a background that's already been chosen for you, a template that's already been chosen for you. Right. Yeah, um, you, you, go ahead, what, yeah, you just have to work within what you have. I, I know what right. you mean about the name of the center or whatever on it. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. Well, and it, so what I hear you saying is that it, choose something that, that will work within the context of what you're trying to do. If you're doing image heavy uh, slides, for example, dark backgrounds work better text heavy slides it it would vary i guess depending on the setting in which you're going to give it mm -hmm. i think so um if it's a room where there's the light is fairly fairly bright um i like mm -hmm. a white background better um, right. because it looks more like a a page i guess a, a mm -hmm. page of a book um the black can be kind of annoying after a while um, right <laughs> right if you're in a light room, it's just like why why is the background black but uh -huh. Um, I think, you know, if you just kind of think about where you're presenting, um, it, it, it just, you can kind of decide light or dark and mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the main decision. And then I think you can play around with what you want on your slide. If you want a border, okay, don't make it mm -hmm. too fussy. <laughs> right. Um, but I think less is, is more. And it, like, look at Steve Jobs talks mm. for Apple. There's nothing right. on those slides. Nope. It sounds like no. it sounds like Spinal Tap. I don't know if you've seen that movie. <laughs> I have, of course. <laughs> that, of course. Look at that black album. There's there's nothing on that right. album. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly true. Right. So, but and and one one other thing, I just wanted to to see get your thoughts on in terms of um, if you're gonna make your own template or if you're gonna go without a template or whatever. One of the things that I've always found, and I think you mentioned this in one of your presentations, that it drives me nuts when I can't, when I don't have consistency on where to look for particular things on the slide, like where the title is, where the text starts, all that oh, stuff. Do you have yeah. any thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. I, I like the title and the text to be in very consistent places. If I'm going to use a running header throughout the presentation, which I'm actually kind of going away from. Mm -hmm. Um but if I if I do have a header, then I put it on the same exact place on every slide and I just I just start with a one slide and I duplicate that slide. Mm -hmm. So I'll make a slide with text and a header and then I'll duplicate it and then use that slide for my next one and so forth. Mm -hmm. That way everything's exactly the same because it bugs right. me. Uh, totally understand. Totally it may be just our our shared neurosis on that, Christine, but <laughs> I don't think we're alone. Yeah. Well blood, <laughs> I know blood bank is kind of a Kind of an OCD sort of a specialty. No, I don't. I don't mean that badly. <laughs> he was the same way. You know, it's very detailed. You have to. Yes. Oh. You know. Good. Okay. So, so I think we've, uh, un unless I'm missing something, I think we've we've covered the first tip, which is to p either pick a simple template or make your own template, avoiding the busy stuff in the background. Is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, awesome. You put it very well. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> you wrote it. So anyway, um, <laughs> okay, so that is tip number one. Let us move on and do tip number two. And I love this tip because it is, if there's any pet peeve about presentations, it would be, well, either this one or number four, but let's do number two. What is top tip number two to make your next presentation awesome, Christine? Yeah, th this uh, this tip is don't crowd the slide with text. Oh, and yes. I think this uh, this is the the post that I got the most responses on, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what everybody says, you know, just, just don't put so much text on the slide. And, and then the, the bad thing about part of the bad thing about doing that is you can't read it if you're sitting in the audience. But the mm -hmm. other bad thing is that the student, the presenter is sort of tempted to stand up there and just read the whole thing. Right. That's no good. No. I mean, then you don't even need to come. So more to come on that. Yeah, but yeah. so so how do you? I mean, how do you judge how much is too much? Well, that's a that's a good question. And different. I, I've I've kind of listened to different people talk about presentations, and some people have very specific rules, like no more than thirty thirty uh, words on the slide. Oh wow! Um, which is kind of impossible with mm -hmm. medical presentations. I would say um, I don't have any specific rules, but you can kind of just see what looks good and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. I don't think you should have really more than four bullets or maybe five. Mm -hmm. And I try not to make the, the if you're going to use bullets, which I don't really like that much, but you, you kind of um, end up falling into that, I think, a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you do make a bullet, it shouldn't have like 
eight lines of text associated right. with it, like one or two. And I think um, the problem that people have is that they feel like they're not going to have everything on the slide and that they're going to be missing something. And right. you will miss something. Mm-hmm. But you can't put everything on each slide. That's that's kind of the point. So either just be comfortable with that and get used to it or make a handout that has everything in it if you really feel like you want to make sure the audience walks away with something that has all the information. Because That's you can't so possibly, important. yeah, you can't put Go it ahead. on. Go ahead, I'm everybody. sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, you were right. I, I, I was just going to interject that that's, I, that I think is something that, that people miss. They think about, okay, if someone looks at my slide later and they see that I left this out, oh my goodness, they're going to freak out. But realistically, people don't understand that, that you're defeating the, the purpose of the people that are listening to you present right now by drowning them with information. Right. Right. And, and they end up just reading the slide, too, and then they don't hear mm-hmm. what you're saying. And mm-hmm. uh, Plus, it's just ugly, and I don't like ugly things. <laughs> Pretty things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. That, that's, uh, that is, a, that is a, an excellent point. Do you have any other... Uh, I mean, one of the things that I always have seen people struggle with on this is when they're trying to reduce the amount of text on a slide, they will resort sometimes to doing funky things like using abbreviations that no one knows what they mean. Yes. Oh. Any comments on that? Yeah, that's a really good point. I think I've been tempted to do that too, just to, to cut the wording down, but don't do that. Just mm-hmm. don't. Um, write the word out or mm-hmm. leave it out or think of a different word because there's nothing more. Well, there is some more annoying things than that, but <laughs> that is one of the most annoying things when you see a, a, a an abbreviation and it's not something that's really, really obvious. Right. You know, MD, okay, you can do that, but mm-hmm. um, you, you just don't ever want to assume that people are going to know um, what those abbreviations are. Yes. I actually read through my post, um, you, uh, you referred to the, the post I'd written, I read through them mm-hmm. a couple of days ago, and I, I'd written something like the mom rule, I can't remember what it is now, <laughs> I love my mom, um, but she isn't a medical person, and so right. my rule, if she knew what the, you know, what the abbreviation if she knows what that is, then I can put it in there. If she doesn't, nice. then I shouldn't. And part, <laughs> part of the reason is because I'm lecturing to medical students, you know, mm-hmm. who are beginning on on their journey. Maybe if you're lecturing to, you know, super specialized fellows, then, yeah. then you have a different rule. But I think the principle is still the same. I really do. I, I it's it is annoying to make people try and figure out what you mean. Uh, yeah. by by putting some obscure abbreviation, even if it's something that some of them know. I would argue even if it's something that everybody knows, even if it's not blatantly obvious on your slide, it, it really has no place there from my perspective. I agree. I definitely yeah. agree. And you certainly don't want to seem like you're trying to come off as, um, well, you are an expert, but you want to be on the, on the student's level or the, right. the audience's level. So. Mm-hmm those barriers, I think. One of the things that I will often tell residents when I'm giving them feedback about presentations is that it really doesn't cost anything to make a second slide on a particular thing. I mean, mm-hmm. so, so you've got all this, all this stuff that you're trying to smush into one slide. Okay, we'll make it a couple slides. So decrease the amount of words on each slide. But it's in the old days, back when, and I'm, I'm, you may be too young for this, Christine, but back in my day when I was starting uh, doing presentations and you would make a, pre- make a slide and you had to either take a picture of it or run it through a program to make a, a, you know, an actual <laughs> yeah. 35 millimeter slide. Yeah. Each slide <laughs> cost you money. So that, that right. you, you'd get everything you could. But, you know, digital is cheap. It's uh, mm-hmm. literally no cost to make an additional slide. Yep, I think that's a good point. Very good point. Yeah. Okay, so we've got uh, tip number two, which is don't crowd the slide with text. And, and I, I know I can speak for Christine when I say I'm begging you, don't crowd the slide with text, please. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like that. Nobody likes that. Um, right. So that's tip number two. Let us move on and, uh, and do tip number three. What is that, Christine? Tip number three is use the right font. Ah. And, um, this is something that I have struggled with. I, I don't even want to know. I don't even know if I have them, but my initial, my very first presentations, I, I'm sure were in just the worst font ever. Mm-hmm. Um, the font that you use on a slide that you project in front of a room is not the same. The, the qualities that make that font good um, 
uh, do not hold for like fonts in books. They're not the same. Mm. You think they would be, but they're not. You want to make sure that whatever font you choose for your slide is, uh, first of all, it's it's legible or readable from the very back of the room. If it's too fancy, mm -hmm. uh, people won't be able to read it. Mm -hmm. And you also want it to convey some um, authority or uh, credibility. You want it to. You don't want it to be too foofy either. Mm -hmm. And if it's too cute, then, you know, like if it's Comic Sans or uh, uh, don't even get me going on that or uh, uh, curls or something like that, you know, right. of course, you can't, you know, that's, that's going to give a very sort of childlike uh, feeling to your presentation. So but it's, yet it's, I see that a lot. I see, I it, see it too. I mean, even at national meetings, I see people using what Comic Sans and I want to throw something. I know. It's like, <laughs> Really? <laughs> it's so funny. It looks like a kindergarten font. I, it does. I just hate. I really hate that font. Um, <laughs> so noted. <laughs> sorry. <It's> okay. <laughs> I'll get off that. But um, another thing with with um, trying to use a simple font is to try to stay away from serifs or serifs. I'm not sure how you say that. I'm not either. Um, <laughs> Explain that to us, though. I, the, I, 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 yeah. That's a phrase I've heard a lot, and I don't know what it means. It uh, serifs or serifs are those little liney things on the top of letters, so like, mm. or on the bottom. So like an M, um, some fonts will just have the lines that touch the the baseline, and some mm -hmm. will have little horizontal lines on each of the three points of the M oh, at okay. the bottom, like little feet. Mm -hmm. um, and they they exist on the top of some letters too. They're just like little things that hang off the letter, and they look really nice when you're reading a book, mm -hmm. actually. And I like those fonts better for books, for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but they don't work well on a slide. Um, they just they just don't. So you should look for sans serif fonts uh, uh, for the most part. Without okay, I get Maybe it. You can, without you can, without the squigglies, sans. Yeah, serif. Okay, yeah. yeah. You've French. taught me something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you can sometimes get away with a, a, a serif font, I think, if you're just using it for a heading mm -hmm. or you're just using it for the title. Um, but I think you should be wary of combining fonts, too. Um, you have to be very judicial, I think, about mm -hmm. using multiple fonts. It just gets too messy. So, okay. um, Well, what are, what are yeah, some examples of, of fonts that you... say that, about the fonts. Okay. Well, what are some examples of, mm -hmm. of fonts that you might recommend? Um, I, my favorite one right now, <laughs> this is my favorite font. That sounds yes. so silly, but my favorite <laughs> font right now is, um, Calibri. Uh -huh. It's a, it's a sensory font. Um, I, I believe it's Mac and, uh, and, uh, Microsoft both. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think if you, if you just really want to make sure, um, that it's a very traditional sensory font and that you're going to absolutely draw no attention to it, then I would go with Helvetica which mm -hmm. has been around forever. There's sure. actually a cool video about Helvetica um, on Netflix. It's a documentary about how, how they oh, really? came up with it oh. and uh, how some people said it was boring, but why, why it really works. <laughs> um, so Helve Helvetica, I think, is, is traditional, and you can't ever go wrong. Calibri is a little bit more slanty, just a little mm -hmm. more interesting. Um, Verdana is good, too. Not oh. Arial. Gosh, don't use Not that. Ar okay. It's the worst. <laughs> What's, what's wrong with Ariel? What's the it's deal? It's just horrible. I tell you, you make a slide, make a slide, and you know, do it all right. Make the uh -huh. heading and make like four bullets if you want or whatever, and make your little text and put it all in Arial. Okay. And then copy the duplicate the slide and put it all in Calibri or Helvetica, uh -huh. even better okay. Helvetica. And you flip them both up, and you'll want to puke when you look at Arial. <laughs> I'm I'm serious. You don't. I don't even know what it is. There's something about the width of the letters. I don't know. It's too oh roundy. Oh my gosh, that's fantastic. Okay, I, I'm going to try I, that. I could be crazy. <laughs> you tell me, if I might be crazy. <laughs> well, I, I I have no comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's why. <laughs> so we've so you've talked about the style of the fund, and that is obviously important. Um, I it's also important to to and this kind of goes a little bit with the the previous topic that the yeah. previous point about the crowding the slide but what about the size yeah the size is really important too and i think that's another um thing that that uh people do wrong in my opinion mm -hmm. in trying to get enough what they think is enough text onto the slide they'll just make the font smaller mm -hmm. and um you really shouldn't do that for one thing it's it's not great to have inconsistent sizes on different slides right. for the most part because it, it just conveys this kind of disorderly look. But also it's just not legible. Um, right. 
even from the front of the room, a small font isn't. So really, uh, for presenting, I suggest nothing smaller than 28 mm-hmm. point. Um, and you can get away with 24 sometimes, but 28 would be best. And headings, of course, should be bigger than that, maybe right. 32 or 36. But um, really nothing smaller than 28. Um, and once you do that, you'll realize how few words you really can put on a on a slide without yeah. running off the slide. Yeah. And that's okay. I mean, that goes to point number two. Mm-hmm. If, if you keep your, if you don't have your, your text size adjusting, and, and I know, I know in, key, uh, can you do it in Keynote? I know you can do it in PowerPoint to set, yeah. set it to automatically change the size of the font to make it fit. Bad yeah, move in my, in my opinion. Yeah. I, do, I, I hate it when it's set to that. I go and yep. change it because, yep. yeah, you want to just keep it all consistent. Agreed. Well, and one of the things that, that, Again, as long as we're doing pet peeves, and we're in full nerd alert right now. By the way, we're talking about <laughs> we we're talking about style and size of fonts, but it's awesome. It's it's really important. But one of the things that that can okay, you gave your pet peeve, and Ariel makes you want to throw up. Um, yeah. When when I'm sitting in a presentation and someone throws a slide up and they immediately apologize for the slide, I know it's like okay, then fix it. Don't, right. if the text is too small, if you know this is a problem, then fix it. And I, right. in full disclosure, I've done it myself. I admit it. I but, too. <laughs> but man, it just drives you crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, right. It's like, you know, you had five minutes before the presentation, you could just take it out or change it or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. I know. Yeah. And w- w- so I think that the, you'll have a tip for us a little bit later on in, in tip number five that actually can help with that. So let's let's hang on to that thought for now. So okay. so t- uh, tip number three is to use the right font. And uh, and to, just to summarize, you want to think about using a, a, a relatively simple font, a sans serif font, if possible, or sans serif, however you want to however you mm-hmm. want to pronounce it, uh, and consider making the size of the font not only consistent between slides, but generally in the range of 28 points for, the, uh, for your body text. Is that, right. did I get that right? Yeah, yep, okay. that's what I would. I win. I Yay. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> tip number four. What is that, Christine? Uh, tip number four is don't read off your slides. Oh. And I, I think that's something that, you know, I've, I've done. I've certainly done it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm, I just... Uh, it's, it's a horrific thing when I get up there and I realize I don't know what I was going to say about the slide. Yep. And so I look at the slide and I read it. And if you've done your slides right, uh, you really can't do that very well <laughs> because mm-hmm. you won't have full sentence after full sentence. So it right. kind of forces you to talk a little bit more. But um, I, I think that that is probably a, a pet peeve of many people. Yes. You know, I hear that and I read that in, in evaluations all the time of, of our lecturers. Uh, he, he or she just stood there and read the slides. I could have just stayed home. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. That's it, uh, you know what? Let me. I'm sorry for for interrupting, yeah. but in in this age where I'm sure you're experiencing this in your medical school and dental school classes, where where more and more people are wanting to do that, they're just like, yeah, I don't need to go to the presentations. I can. Uh, I'll have someone, you know. FaceTime me in or something and I, or, or just, you know, I'll look at it later or whatever in that age. If you're not giving people a reason to actually be there, they're not gonna. I totally agree with that. And, um, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, we, we record our lectures both at the medical school and, and at the dental school, the medical mm-hmm. school pretty much makes us the dental school. It's kind of optional. And mm-hmm. so the students do have the option to stay home. And if they're mm-hmm. not coming to class, uh, it, it means something. It means you're yes. not giving them, a reason mm-hmm. and it's, it's boring and you're reading off the slides or, or there's no interaction and there's no point to coming. So, right. um, yeah. Well, so, so how can people avoid that? I, I mean, obviously it's easy to say, Hey, don't read off your slides, right. but from the practical perspective, how can they do that? I think the most important thing is to practice your talk. And, uh, uh that's something that I, I think I've been guilty of not doing, um, quite often. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I, I spend all this time making pretty slides because I like them to look good. And then it's like the day before the presentation or the hour before. And I'm like, oh, crap, I didn't <laughs> think about what I was going to say. <laughs> yes. So um, practicing is really important. And there's all kinds of things um, that, that we could talk about, you know, how, how to go about practicing. But mm-hmm. um, that just that general idea of, of talking through it, I think, is really important. And not just sitting at your computer in your chair all comfy and flipping through the slides that and thinking in your head you actually have mm-hmm. to vocalize you have yes. to say it out loud because once you start talking you realize oh 
I got to pick that word or, mm-hmm. you know, how am I going to explain this thing? Right, so, right. Talking through it is, is important. That's and and actually I I misspoke earlier. I said you were going to talk. You were going to give us tips about uh, this very thing in point five. I actually meant point four. But before we let this go, um, and don't worry about time. We're we're good on time. Uh, okay. I I would love for you to just give us some some practical tips on practice. That that sounds weird, doesn't <laughs> it? Practical tips on practice. So you're sitting there and you you know you've got a presentation in three or four days or whatever. Hopefully. Okay. I'm. I admit I'm guilty of this all the time. You haven't procrastinated. You've got your slides <laughs> at least somewhat close to ready. So, just for someone who's who's trying to figure out how best to do this, how how would you advise people to consider the the whole practice regimen? Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you how I do it and what what works for me. Um, mm-hmm. If if you you can read tons of books on this, and I think that can be really helpful. Steve Jobs. Um, his his presentations were amazing. Mm-hmm. I, I love to watch them, and he makes it look so effortless. Like he's just just got up there and talked about it. But he practiced for hours, um, just hours and hours for yep. a single presentation. So I think you need to make sure you set aside enough time. And like you said, it's really easy to procrastinate, and I do mm-hmm. that all the time. But um, save save time for practicing, even at the expense of your slides. Mm-hmm. So if it, it, the, the um, temptation for me is to try to keep focusing on my slides and making them more and more perfect. But at a certain point, you don't get that much back. You mm-hmm. can spend another hour, but you know, you're just shuffling things around on the screen and, and it's right. not really going to do anything. So leave time. And I think the best, I think the best advice I would have is to, to, um, try to leave time to go through it at least three times all Mm -hmm. the whole thing start to finish so if it's an hour lecture at least three hour three one hour run throughs and it's probably going to take you more time than that Mm -hmm. um and that sounds crazy but i think steve jobs went through his like i don't even know how many times 20 or 30 i think um also the other thing is to initially start out by making notes um, and you can do that right in the in the notes part of either Keynote or PowerPoint. Mm-hmm. And just to remind yourself of, of points you want to explain more fully. And you can feel free to write as much as you want down there because the audience isn't going to see it. And that way you can kind of dump your brain in right. that part of the slide and you'll, you'll have it permanently. So make notes about what you want to say and then don't look at them when you practice mm. or try not to. You mm-hmm. know, So run through it the first time. Try to remember all those points that you made in your notes section. But don't don't let yourself look at it. And then you'll see just how, you know, kind of where you are as far as what you need to try to remember. The second time you run through it is more about um, getting the words right, specific words that you want to say and trying mm-hmm. to get those, you know, the, the ancillary points or the, the filling in uh, points t- to get them into your head. Mm-hmm. And by the time you do it a couple times, they'll start to really stick there. And then the last time is just to kind of finesse and get the timing down and um, to, to kind of get it into your muscle memory. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but <laughs> the more times you do it, the more comfortable you'll be. And when you get up in front of the students, it'll feel more like you've done this before, you know, it's like yes. riding a bike. So yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's what I would, that's kind of the way I do it. Very true, and I, I I have to say it's it's rare for me to practice three times, but I always try to run through mine at, at least once. One of the things that that jumps out at me when I do that is what I was what we were talking about in the last tip is that when I get to the point when I get to a slide and I'm practicing my presentation and I feel like apologizing for it, that's mm-hmm. the time that I say I got to fix this slide. Right, and, and that if you if if you're surprised by something you have to apologize for, then you haven't done enough prep work, basically, from my perspective. Yeah, that's a really good point. It, it helps you see your slides from the point of view of the audience right. when you're talking through them. It's also, if you can, it's a great idea to give, to walk through the slides in the room you're going to be in. And that's not always uh, possible, but that, that even makes it, it makes the kind of stage fright thing a little bit easier, mm-hmm. I think. Mm-hmm. Videotaping is also good, but that (laughs) it's a really good idea to do it and just to force yourself and then just, I don't know, go have a drink or something if you're a drinker. (laughs) I'm not, but something like that because it's painful. Me either, but doing that might make me want to (laughs) start. It's a good exercise. 
But it, it, I think you make a, a really crucial point there. Even if even if you don't video yourself, at least at least audio uh, record yourself. And what yep. what you will almost always find is little, not necessarily annoying things, but things that you're doing that you don't necessarily realize. How many times you say um? How many times mm-hmm. you? Uh, there was a time in my in my experience as a lecturer, and I didn't realize this until someone made a joke about it at the end of one of my lectures that I said <laughs> basically as a transition word <laughs> approximately four thousand times per lecture. So basically, <laughs> blah blah blah. So basically, blah blah blah. And by the time the end of the lecture came, people were saying it along with me, and I said I might have a problem here. That's funny. That's <laughs> that's really true, though. You don't realize when no. you're talking in front of a room, you're so. Um, in the moment that you don't really realize you're doing that. Exactly. exactly. I, I, um, I'll just, this is a personal disclosure, but I'll just, I'll say it. Okay. I didn't it's really okay. Realize. Nobody's listening, Christine. Okay. Sorry, don't worry. <laughs> you can always cut this off. <laughs> I realized, uh, once I started doing that, taping myself, that, um, I had this really annoying habit of, I don't even know what it's called, but it's like making a little t- sound like I would, <laughs> and then, and I take a little breath, and it's so <laughs> annoying. I listened to it, and I couldn't even watch the lecture. So I had to really try not to do it. And I, I periodically will watch videos, even though it's annoying, just to make sure I don't do that. Right. It's just a, I wouldn't want to sit in that lecture. I understand. <laughs> okay, so tip number four is uh, don't read off the slides. Let's actually quickly summarize where we've been so far. P- tip number one, pick a simple template. Tip number two, don't crowd the slide with text. Tip number three, use the right font. Tip number four, please, for the love of God, don't read off the slides. <laughs> I added a little bit to that. Um, and so finally, basically, let, sorry, couldn't help myself. Let us do tip number five. What is tip number five, Christine? Let me do mine. Okay. Tip number five <laughs> nice. is, um, and this one, this one is... Um, particularly important, I think, for medical presentations mm-hmm. that make your graphs awesome, make them mm-hmm. legible, make them not painful. I think a lot of the slides, you mentioned people apologizing for slides, and I think a lot of them are graph yes. slides, yes. Gra- tables or graphs or whatever, data. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Put it up and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, this is so small, I'm sure you can't see it. Right. Well, then don't, you know, yeah, don't redo do it. it. <laughs> yep. And, you know, not not all of us have a lot of time. I, I have more time because that's my job now is to teach. But if you're a busy medical student and you got to give a presentation tomorrow, you might not have time, mm-hmm. you know, but if you do have time, you can redo a graph and, mm-hmm. and make it so it is legible. And there's some things we can talk about with that. So yeah, please. So let's, one thing I, I, I do want to, before we get to the, the, the details of, of how to do this, um, I think it's important for since we're talking to to students and people maybe beginning in in the field, that you do have to be a little bit careful with this. You can't just steal someone else's data and make a brand new chart without crediting them. For example, it's it's important to understand that copyrights are important and they're there for a reason, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. You mm-hmm. certainly want to honor that. Yep. But um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with showing the data in a different way, mm-hmm. as long as you're you know referencing the original right. source, right? Because you're trying to get the point across and, mm-hmm. and showing a busy graph that you can you can see when you're reading a journal um, is not it, some something like that is just not going to work right. on, on a PowerPoint slide. Agreed, and I think you, I actually think you honor the the people that have done the work more when you rather than throwing up a blurry, tiny, weird looking you know screen capture of something that they've done in a journal, but to act to actually make it so that it can be visible in your presentation, as long as you're crediting them, there's, I have no issue with that either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think um, if you are redoing um, a graph, one thing to do is to clean up the X and Y axes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to have all those tick marks on there. You have to have enough so that the graph makes sense. Mm-hmm. But if if you're looking at six-month and 12-month outcomes or something, you don't have to have six you know, Mm -hmm. ticks between zero and six, you can just put in the six. Sure. Um, And that makes it easier to see. Um, You can also clean up the the titles for the X and Y axes and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, summarize them or make them bigger. The font needs to be big enough so that people can see it. So that size uh, rule comes into play and you might be able to get away with 24, 
um, okay. font, especially in, mm-hmm. a, in a graph. But you really have to as long as it's Comic that. Sans, you mean, as, yeah, or right. Arial? That's right. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Sorry. Don't sorry, even. Sorry. I just wanted the reaction. That's. Yeah, uh, that, I knew I would get it. it. <laughs> so the axes are important. The the um, if you're doing a, a graph or a chart, then you want to also look at the the lines for the data, and um, you may be able to remove some points on there too. You want to show where the data changes and and make sure that you got the the main point. Uh, across in your mm-hmm. in your rendition, but you don't necessarily need a bazillion data points in there because you can right. see whether it's going up or down. Um, so you know, just kind of the same um, rules or simplifying it. Right. Make it as simple as you can, but no simpler. <laughs> which is- and you made a point in your post that I I loved the way you put this. You you basically said decide what the single most important point of the graph is. Mm-hmm. And, and that's that's the key that to, to figure out exactly what is this graph trying to how does this graph work into my presentation in terms of what I'm trying to illustrate and what the graph was trying to illustrate. Right, and I, I think this is one of the most difficult parts of medical presentations, and nobody really talks about this a lot. If you look at the presentation literature, mm-hmm. um, they talk about how to make your slide pretty, but they don't talk about well, what what if you have to show a graph that's got you know a bunch of different lines on it, a bunch of different data points, and you know, how do you do that so that it's visible from the back of the room and it gets the point across? And mm-hmm. I think that is important to try to think of what, what exactly am I trying to, if I had to summarize this slide in, in a sentence, what, what am I trying to, what am I trying to show Boy, with this graph? Yeah. And then so important. Go from there. So important. I agree. Okay. So we have done all five. I'm going to do them. I'm going to repeat them one more time. And uh, just so everybody gets them really clearly in their head. Tip, the top five tips to make your next, pre- next presentation awesome. Let me try that again. The top five tips to make your next presentation awesome. Number one, pick a simple template. Number two, don't crowd that slide with text. Number three, use the right font. Number four, don't read off the slides. Number five, make your graphs awesome. Uh, Christina, I, I think you've, you've made some amazingly good points. I, I, I really I, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Are, before we close, are we missing anything? Is there anything else you'd like to leave us with uh, as we think about making our presentations better? Oh, I, I think that covers the, the basics. And I would just, uh, part, of, part of number four, don't read off mm-hmm. the slides, is, is practicing. But uh, I would just remind people that that that's a really, really important part. You can get yes. your slides looking perfect, but if you don't practice out loud, um, mm-hmm. it's going to be, it's not going to go as well as you would like. Very, very true. Well, be- before I, before I leave you, I, I do want to mention to everyone, I, Dr. Crafts, I did not come on this podcast to advertise her stuff, but I'm going to do it a little bit for her. Uh, uh, and one of the things that uh, most of the people that are listening to this are going to be blood bank folks, although obviously I'm sure a lot of your audience will listen to this as well, Christine. But people that are in blood banking, I, I just wanted to let you know there's a, several really great resources that, that Christine has on her website, pathologystudent.com. One of them is one of the best summaries of coagulation that you will ever read. Uh, <laughs> Ironclad Guarantee is called Clot or Bleed. It's an ebook. Uh, there's a charge for it. It's nominal. Um, and uh, again, Dr. Crafts did not ask me to do this. I'm doing this on my own. Um, and also for, for those of you interested in heme path, there, there are some things, uh, including uh, her complete but not obsessive hematopathology guide that you can get from uh, pathologystudent.com. So free commercial there, Christine. I, again, you. I know I didn't a- you didn't ask me to do that, but... <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, as we close today, I just, uh, once again, Christine, I want to thank you so much for being here. You've, you've really, really helped us, I think, in, in terms of learning what and what not to do. And, and hopefully we can all go out and give better presentations. So thank you. Oh, thank you. This is a lot of fun. I really appreciate you inviting me. Hi, this is Joe with some closing thoughts. Wasn't she great? Man, I, I had a blast with that interview. Uh, you know, I understand that not everything we discussed will apply to your specific situation. For example, with tip number one, you may not have a choice whether or not uh, to use a template given the constraints of your particular program or your particular hospital. But I hope that if you do have a choice, you'll just try to avoid those really funky, distracting backgrounds as much as you can. It may look cool, but 
yeah, when you start putting stuff on it, it can really mess people up as they're trying to as they're trying to stay with you. Uh, with most of the other tips, I think you will have choices. So again, I, I just hope that you'll utilize the things that we've told you. Uh, Christine and I got into a lot of detail about fonts and font sizes and stuff like that. And while I really hope that wasn't boring, um, I don't think it was, there, but there's still a lot to learn from those discussions. Truth be told, as I looked at this and as I listened to Dr. Crafts talking today, I have violated essentially every one of the tips in this course during my career. And I've given a lot of presentations, and you may know, including ones that are out on the internet in video form and watched over a third of a million times on YouTube. And, and now I want to go back and fix every single one of them. A couple of things just to note. The show page for this episode is on the Blood Bank Guy website at bbguy.org slash podcast. There you'll find a transcript of, this, of the discussion, some example slides showing illustrations of Dr. Kraft's points, and further reading, uh, just some different further reading options for you. You can also sign up there for my free no spam weekly email list to get updates on future podcast episodes and educational blog posts. Finally, if you would, please do me a favor. If you wouldn't mind, next time you're on your computer, head on over to iTunes to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast, podcast page and give me a rating, a review, and subscribe to the podcast. That really helps me get the information in front of more people who might benefit from this information. So now that you're more prepared for your next awesome presentation, I'm going to leave you with just this one thought. As you go through your day, I hope that you smile. I hope that you have fun. And above all, never, ever stop learning. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on the podcast.